Hello, I'm Dr. Allison Dorsey, Professor of History at Swarthmore College. Like many of you, I have spent the past four months in quarantine, absorbed by the national news, reading articles from multiple newspapers, following scholars on Twitter, and listening to endless podcasts, all in the hopes I will read, see, or hear something that helps me make sense of the current healthscape. The anemic and tardy federal response to the COVID-19 crisis has resulted in the catastrophic loss of life, disproportionately the lives of elders and black and brown working class Americans. The stalking and violent slaying of Ahmed Arbery compounded this grief. A nighttime no-knock police raid on the wrong address resulted in the brutal killing of Breonna Taylor. The televised murder of George Floyd, his life extinguished by the cavalier and cruel violence of a Minneapolis policeman ratcheted up feelings of despair and anxiety for many in the nation. The tsunami of protest by activists the world over lifts up the long-standing Black calls for justice. William Faulkner's observation, the past is never dead, it is not even past, resonates in this moment. As someone who studies the Black experience in America with an emphasis on the promise and heartbreak of reconstruction, I cannot shake the sense that I, that the nation, has been here before, too many times before. I taught History 7B in 2019, which coincided with the 100th anniversary of the Chicago riot. I took advantage of the special collection of primary source documents compiled by the NEH and the Newberry Library. One of the most important documents in the collection is the Negro in Chicago, a study of the race relations and a race riot by the Chicago Commission on Race Relations, published in 1922. The commission, appointed by the Illinois governor, was to study the psychological, social, and economic causes which led to the explosion of violence in 1919. Over the course of the term, students learned that neither the commission nor the report was unique. Commissions and reports occurred after each major period of riot and rebellion in America in the 20th and now 21st century. The 1922 report revealed consistent patterns associated with urban uprisings. Police brutality and abuse against black and brown citizens frequently sparked urban uprisings. Urban dwellers struggling with poverty, low wages, high rents, and racial segregation reinforced by targeted white violence arsons and bombings in Chicago before the uprising. Urban unrest led to the destruction of property and businesses of members of the black middle class, sometimes by black residents, but frequently by white rioters and looters, such as the all white athletic clubs in Chicago, who were not infrequently aided and abetted by white law enforcement. Solutions put forward by black sociologists in 1922 focused on the need to address racism and racist behaviors toward blacks. They proposed equitable housing, fair employment practices and increased wages, better schooling and ending police brutality. These suggestions from the 1922 report, the 1968 Kerner Commission report 46 years later and the 2015 Ferguson Commission report 47 years after that advocated radical policy changes to disrupt racism in America. Time after time, these suggestions were set aside in favor of lectures, screeds from white politicians and social critics admonishing the black community. White leaders stressed the need to address Negro degeneracy, dysfunctional black families, and to end black on black crime. White leadership, law enforcement, and American society writ large determined black people were the problem.
not systemic white racism. We will come out on the other side of the current moment, presuming we survive incompetence and corruption, greed and collusion, COVID-19, and the shredding of constitutional and judicial norms. We may again experience peace, but the brick wall of white supremacy and racism will remain. There will soon be more proposals for a commission, a dialogue on race and diversity. As a historian and a citizen, I am preparing myself for the possibility the nation might miss another opportunity to confront and dismantle racism. There are plenty of experts with viable policy proposals for ending racism. Philip Ativa Goff, Sherilyn Eiffel, Ibram Kendi, Susan Rice, Robert Reich, and Elizabeth Warren, to name just a few. Dismantling racism is hard work, and I fear the nation might do what it has done in the past, deflect, ignore, and sweep aside legitimate demands for justice and equity, and simply wait for the next conflagration. On grim days, such as when the number of Americans lost to COVID-19 hit the 110,000 mark, or when American citizens peacefully protesting in front of the People's House were met with tear gas and American servicemen in riot gear, I am tempted to say, let it all burn. Burn down the storied city on a hill, because I am tired of the cognitive dissidence between the imagined and the real. So tired, I can feel the aching knees and sore back of every underpaid, overworked, exploited Black woman who has been designated an essential worker. On better days, the teacher in me who believes in the promise of the future holds sway. That part of me engaged in two nights of hours long conversations with our son, the filmmaker begging him not to go out to record the mayhem in Los Angeles, trying to tamp down his legitimate outrage that the President of the United States publicly toyed with the idea of having American soldiers armed with bayonets confront citizens exercising their First Amendment rights on American soil. It is my job as his first teacher, and as he put it, the historian I have on speed dial, to talk about the other times the nation moved toward the brink, about what has worked in the past and the promise embodied in a new electorate with better ideas and bolder plans for change. It is my job to encourage him to give the system another chance to do the right thing. But will the system get it right? Are the vast majority of white Americans in government, law enforcement, corporations and churches, at universities and colleges, including Swarthmore College, willing to do the work necessary to upend white supremacy and racism? Are those neighbors and colleagues, some of whom marched in pink hats, prepared to do the heavy lifting of working for school integration against economic exploitation and police violence in our county, in our state, in our nation? Will they stop second guessing their human peers who live in black bodies when we say we cannot breathe? There are some signs that the moment is ripe for real change. Americans of all ethnic and racial groups, all genders, generations, religions, and class backgrounds are right now demanding change and calling out racism. There are reasons to be hopeful but we must remain vigilant, mindful that change does not happen, will not happen without focus, sustained pressure, and changes in policy. Transformation requires cultural change in America. Grio and guiding light Toni Morrison centered her work on the lives, art, pain, and joy of Black people. She urged us to know our worth, and to love ourselves irrespective of white supremacy 
and racism. As she noted in an interview, if you can only be tall because somebody is on their knees, then you have a serious problem. My feeling, she continued, is that white people have a very, very serious problem and they should start thinking about what they can do about it. I could not agree more. As we know from American history, the failure to address systemic racism maims civil society in every era, endangers American democracy, and it kills black people. Rest in peace, George Floyd.